So I'll tell you a little bit about myself first, then we'll start diving right into it. My name is Vittorio Romeo. I've been working with C++ for over 10 years. Started as a hobby, as a passion. I actually started thanks to game development. I wanted to make my own games, and I eventually ended up doing a lot of C++. And at the moment, I'm working at Bloomberg. I've been there for more than six years. And currently, my main job is being a technical trainer and teaching modern C++ to new hires, experienced hires, and overseeing the whole C++ training aspect inside the company. I recently co-authored a book with my friend and colleague, John Lakos, uh, Rostislav Klebnikov, Alistair Meredith, and many other people from the ISO committee that reviewed and contributed. If you're interested, this is the book. I can tell you later in the break if you want some more information. And I participate in ISO Civil Plus Standardization. I am a member of the Italian national body. I have a few papers in flight. That's also something that I like to do in my spare time, just because I am a bit of a masochist. And I also like to work with C++ in my free time. I have many open source side projects, mostly related to game development. I maintain uh, SFML, I'm part of the team, and I'm modernizing the library to C++17 uh, in my spare time. I don't know if you've heard of it, but it's a very nice library for uh, basic uh, you know, graphics, sound, multimedia, and uh, networking. I have a few released games, Open Hexagon, Quake VR, which as you might imagine, you know, it's a, a mod for Quake that puts you in virtual reality. So I play with that as well. A few tools and libraries, video tutorials, articles. So if you want to check this stuff out, we can talk during the break. But I'm going to go straight into it. And this talk is going to be a bit experimental, a bit different from what I usually do. I've been usually doing very technical, like metaprogramming talks and stuff like that. But I wanted to step back a bit, be a little bit more philosophical, and try to um, distill and understand what simplicity is, especially in the context of C++ code, and try to give people some advice on how to manage it. So I care in general about taming complexity, and that comes from multiple areas. Uh, in my open source work, as I mentioned, while migrating SFML to 17, we had a lot of debates and questions about, should we use this feature? Should we do this this way or this other way? So what is the actual simpler way of doing that? Uh, when I teach, I also want to teach modern C++, but of course, it's very vast. There's a lot of things that can go wrong, so what do I decide to teach? In the book, simplicity is one of our goals. We want to teach all the possible things that can go wrong so that you can decide what to use or what not to use. And in general, I feel like coding is not just a tool, at least for me. For some people, it isn't. That's totally fine. But I like seeing it as an art, as you know, being able to get better at those things like elegance, having your code be more readable, more simple. And I think uh, that is something that really motivates me to get better at C++. So, Complexity in general can appear both a high level and low level. With high level, I mean things like the architecture of your software, maybe the patterns you're using, uh, the design of your system. And with low level, we go a little bit more into the C++ side of things. So how you design an abstraction? Should you use a template, a concept, spin, and stuff like that? What's the coding style? Should I use this feature? Should it be banned? And in general, should I apply everything from C++ or should we be more selective? This talk will mainly focus on the low-level complexity. It's more about the C++ side of things, but the guidelines that we're going to derive here are also sort of applicable at a high level, so they kind of work there as well. The goals are basically two. We will derive, let's say, two pragmatic and actual guidelines from some various examples we're going to see. And ideally, once we have these uh, guidelines, whenever you face a situation where you're not sure what, what the simplest way to do something is, by following this, it should help you, um, you know, make a decision. And let's keep it interactive. I'm going to ask you to raise your hands, tell me what you, what you like on the slide, and potentially ask you to why you like something. So please, let's, let's keep it interactive. That said, let's begin. So, Let's try doing this. I show you two snippets. They should be like equivalent in terms of behavior, but they are written in a slightly different style, slightly different way. So I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand with a closed hand if you like the first one more, or with an open hand if you like the second one more. Okay. And now I'm curious. I want somebody from each side to tell me why you like the first one, why you like the second one. Any volunteer for the first one? Why do you like it more than the second one? Yeah? Uh, is that again? Yeah, assignment is a clear form of understanding that if I initialize it, 
Okay, so to rephrase that, the first one, uh, somebody likes it more because using the equal sign makes it more clear that you are initializing the thing from a list of values. Is that sort of right? Anybody from the second side? Yes. Okay, that's interesting. So the, the, the second opinion is the C semantics, you know, using a C style array on the, first, on the left hand side is a bit scary. Maybe you're not sure how it really works. Well, the second one using std array is something that you're more familiar with. It's more modern, right? Okay. Let's keep going. I'm not going to give you any answer. Maybe there is no answer. I'm just trying to see what you think like and making you think a bit. What about these ones? Who likes the first one or the second one? Same thing as before. And if you don't raise your hand, I'm going to assume you like both or you don't like either. Well, that's fine. Okay, so I see overwhelming, uh, you know, uh, preference for the second one. So who likes the first one? What's the, your rationale for that? Anybody? Yeah? Uh, if it wasn't an int, so I would take the left one. Okay, so you're saying if it wasn't an int, I would take the left one. That's interesting. And I like that. We're going to see um, some opinions have on this later. And somebody from the other side, why do you like the other one? Yeah. <laughs> so Jonathan says it works in C++ 98. I, I see you're a bit biased on that subject, but yeah, it's true. It's simpler, right? Maybe. So, So oh, can I rephrase that as the first one doesn't add anything over the second one? It feels more redundant. Okay. We can go forever, but this one is the last one I'm gonna ask you to speak about and I wanna hear, especially from people from the left side, what do you think, uh, why would you pick the left side if you would pick the left side? Anybody for the left side? Okay. Uh, somebody new? Maybe here? Okay. Yeah, so the, the comment here is that the first step is a step towards abstraction. The second side has more moving parts, it's, it's telling you what to do, sorry, how to do it, while the left hand side is just telling you what to do and then we leave the details to the compiler. Anybody that wants to defend the old good for loop? No, nobody likes the for loop? Okay. I like that. So the second one, maybe it's less abstract, but everybody's familiar with it. It's something that is in many languages and doesn't require knowing what I range is and things like that. Okay, so these are the sort of questions that I ask myself all the time when I'm writing code, especially when I'm teaching, because I want to make sure that what I'm teaching people, yes, has advantages, but also has to feel familiar, has to feel simple. And generally speaking, defining simplicity and complexity, I find it really hard. And I would argue that we have an intuition for it, like we can see some code and even though we have different opinions, we have a feeling for what's simple, what's complex. But we also have biases and this is something that, especially nowadays, we should try and look into and fix in, in all areas of our life. But even in coding, for example, familiarity, that's a bias, right? Maybe you've used C a lot, C sharp a lot, so it's natural for you to see the for loop as something that's easier, familiar. If you say the same thing to somebody that's been doing functional programming all their life and then they get into C++, maybe ranges will be more familiar than for loop. So that's also something to take into account. Generally speaking, I'm gonna say some things. I hope you all agree with this. We deem code to be simple if it's easy to understand, maintain, change, debug, and test. It protects us from mistakes at compile time. You know, if the code is correct by definition, like it cannot be wrong and it will stop your compile time, that's simpler to deal with it. And the last one is something that I care about. It has a limited amount of moving parts. So whenever you see something which has a lot of mutation, a lot of variables, you have to keep all those things in your head while you're trying to understand the code. If the number of moving parts is limited, you can actually focus on the business logic and on the things that matter. So that's why I think it's, um, I, I put it as far as simplicity. Unfortunately, uh, there's always trade-offs. Like, 
I'm not gonna say that I have the answer to write the simplest code ever, but you have to th know what you're optimizing for. And in general, I prefer optimizing for readability, for code that has to be maintained and read from multiple people. There are valid use cases in, in the industry to optimize for writability. If you're writing prototypes, if you're writing games and you have like the crunch time, which is terrible, but some people do that, maybe at that point, optimizing for writability makes more sense. But I like to believe that most of the work we're gonna do is gonna live for years after we stop working on it and other people are gonna you know, have to deal with it. So I wanna optimize for readability and maintainability. So let's compromise, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna somewhat agree on what simplicity means by looking at some examples and we're gonna derive some more general precepts from these examples and then we're gonna discuss where these precepts fall short in the real world and hopefully get some um, concrete and pragmatic uh, advice from there. Okay, let's start with the first one. There's gonna be two, and let's start with the first one. So again, let's keep this interactive. I'm gonna tell you that we have this function. It's called a uh, fill texture rectangle function. It takes a color, and it takes the position and the width and the height of the rectangle. You can imagine this might be part of a basic graphic library or something like that. And then given this API, which we might have no control over, which one do you prefer between these two snippets? Okay. Okay, I see most people prefer the one on the right, the one with static cast. And some people, a few people still prefer the one on the left. I want to talk about casting. It's a very commonly discussed topic, but for me, this is one of the first places where we can start getting some, let's say, uh, definitions out. So C-style casts are syntactically very concise, right? They are convenient to write, everybody's familiar with them if you've been using C, and static cast is objectively more verbose. You have to write more code, put the angle brackets and that stuff, right? However, objectively speaking, a static cast is mechanically simpler than a C-style cast. Why? This is CPP reference the, 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 let's say, one part of the page that explains what a C-style cast is. And as you can see, the C-style cast can do a lot of things. But maybe most of you are familiar with this, but a C-style cast can perform a const cast, a static cast, our interpret cast, and you can do that in that order. It, it does a lot of things. So just the fact that, you know, static cast appears in the definition of the C-style cast makes that a building block of this feature. So it's a simpler sort of, you know, um, abstraction compared to the C style cast. So why do I think it's simpler? I think the static cast is simpler because, as I mentioned, a C style cast is defined in terms of it, so it's the fundamental building block. A C style cast is more powerful than a static cast, and when you have more power, then you have more flexibility, but also you, you have a bigger surface area to think about. C style cast has more implicit behavior, and it can be more error prone. Maybe in the example we've shown, just casting to an int is fine. But if you use this tool consistently, then you can get into positions where it might do the wrong thing and even cause undefined behavior. This is a um, screenshot from a paper that's in flight. I think it's from Herb Satter, and it's a paper about pattern matching. I love to see pattern matching in C++, but one of the things that, that is being proposed um, alongside that is this as operator that you can basically use to convert any expression to some type. So you can arbitrarily say x as t, where x is an expression and t is any type, and this operator will do its best to convert this, um, this expression. Now, I see the value in this. I see the value in having a single tool that is very simple and easy to use and does, and, and does the right thing. But if I look at the way it's defined, that for me is the opposite of simplicity. Like, this single keyword can actually do a lot of things. It can be the same as a static cast. It can be the same as a dynamic cast. It can actually, uh, you know, do multiple conversion, find conversion operators. There's, it's even overloadable. So, you might be getting the idea that I'm not really a fan of this. I like when things are very narrowly scoped and they do one thing. I want code to be more explicit. And I think we want to go in the direction of static cast rather than adding something even more complicated than C style cast. Okay, another example, this one. Which one do you find simpler? The 
You'll see the difference is just using in place back versus push back. <laughs> so anybody that finds in place back simpler can uh, explain. Sure. Okay, so you are for pushback or, uh, yeah. So you're saying pushback is the simpler one, the more common one, so for an int, it doesn't give you any advantage, so I'll just go with pushback. Anybody that likes in place back more? You like in place back, I'm sorry, now you have to say why. In this case, it doesn't matter, actually. Okay. But, but, but it's nicer to use this because it's better practice to use in place back, not pushback. Okay, so the, question, the, the argument here is good, right? In this, place, it, in this case, it doesn't matter. It might be the same as pushback, right? But in terms of good practice, using a place back consistently might be a good idea. Okay, I disagree with you, but we'll see why. <laughs> what about this one? So is anybody not familiar with scoped lock? Okay, let me, let me explain very quick. Like scoped lock is the same as lock guard, but you can initialize it with any number of mutexes at the same time. So for example, if you have three or four mutexes, you can pass them all at once in the constructor of the scope lock, and it's gonna lock them at, in, in the right order to avoid um, deadlocks caused by or, you know, order mismatches in mutexes. Lock guard only takes one. Okay, I'm not gonna ask anything, we're careful of time, but these two would do the same thing, but why would you use one or the other? And we'll see the, the logic behind that. So, my argument is this one. If we think about casting and placing back, locking, what is in common in terms of simplicity? And if I ask you that you have to hang a painting to the wall using a nail, what tool would you pick? Would you pick the hammer? Or would you pick the jackhammer? That's my argument here, right? When you wanna do something simple and the task is very well defined, you should use the tool that's, you know, most suitable for the job. And in this case, I see a lot of analogies here with what we've seen in the previous snippets. So a C-style is more powerful than a static cast. And place back is more powerful than pushback. It can do everything that pushback can, but more. And scope lock is more powerful than a lock guard. It can do anything that lock guard can, but more. And with great power comes great responsibility, popularized by Spider-Man. This is not the right image, but I liked it. So, you know, that's what I'm trying to show you here, that even though you can use the most powerful tool for the job, is, the, is that the right thing to do? And here's another example. Um, we have a scope lock, and we have something that might cause a race condition. I wanna ask you if this code, as it is, it's, it's fine, is it gonna do the right thing? Why not? Exactly, so Daisy knows about this. It looks innocent, maybe if you read it by skimming through the code base, it's not gonna cause any alarm bells, but actually you're not doing anything here. It compiles just fine. Yeah, <laughs> but no, nothing is protected. Like, this is not locking any mutex. You're just creating a guard that doesn't guard anything. And the reason for this is the scope lock is highly generic. As I mentioned, it can take any number of mutexes during construction. In even zero, and the standard explicitly says if the number of mutexes you take is zero, this does nothing. And I'm not trying to like be um, specific against scope lock, I'm just trying to say that if you have a tool that can do more than what you need, sometimes you get into situations where it might do things something that you don't expect just because of this extra flexibility that you didn't need in the, you didn't need in the first place. If you were to use lock guard here, this wouldn't even compile. So what about pushback and then place back? So this actually comes from uh, Kate Gregory. I don't remember the name of the talk or the year. I remember it was her for sure. I remember I was in the room. And at that time I was looking to improve my, let's say, readability of my code. And, I, and using and place back was you know, the norm, as somebody mentioned. Everybody says, this is more powerful. Let's use it all over the place. But she said something that really struck with me and um, I kept it inside for a while, I you know, digested it, and, and I strongly believe she was right. And she said, 
If you use them place back all over the place, sure, you might not get any sort of problem or disadvantage, but if you carefully pick the places where you use pushback and then place back, and only use and place back where it actually provides an advantage over pushback, then you are communicating to the reader of the source code that you thought about it, and that and place back has been used here for a reason. If you use it everywhere, then you lose that value in the readability. So uh, this is an example, right? I can have a vector of strings called names. If I am place back a literal, then in place back here is actually beneficial because we are avoiding the initial conversion from the literal to the string and then moving the string. We're actually directly constructing the string from the literal in the buffer of the vector. If I push it back, you will see I have an extra operation. First, I will have to convert the literal to the string on the outside and then move the string on the inside of the vector. That's the pushback over here. But if I am place back, an existing string, like my underscore name over here, since the type is already a string, in either case, both with them place back and push back, this is gonna invoke the copy constructor just once. So there is absolutely no benefit in using and place back in this case. So what's the harm in using and place back all the time? None, but why would you do it when you can communicate intent? And communicating intent to whoever is reading your code is very important to make it more readable and making sure that you know, whoever is reading it knows that you know what you're doing. So again, if we look at this, and I place back the literal, I am making a conscious decision to use it because it provides a benefit over pushback. And if I use pushback for the string, then I'm making a conscious decision to do that because there is no benefit over the use uh, of, of using and place back. So just by looking at this line of code, if we use this rule consistently, you're gonna know in your source code where pushback is just the best you can do, and where in place back is being used for a reason. So that makes sense to everybody. I, yeah. There is a counter argument that of you might not have intelligent people doing this. So yeah. if they're using in place back, the right thing all the time. Yeah, so this is a, an interesting argument, right? You're saying you might have people that are not uh, very well knowledgeable in the difference, <laughs> very well knowledgeable in the difference between pushback or in place back. And my reply is that I work in training, right? I believe that rather than sacrificing the quality of the code base, we have to invest in training more. And especially with C++, you want to make sure that people that are working on your code base are well trained, they know what to have to do. So my answer would be let's invest in teaching people, mentoring people, and reviewing, code reviewing and stuff like that, and teaching people what the best thing to do is. I don't like sacrificing quality uh, for a lack of training, yes. I have a slide on consistency, but it's a good argument. Yeah. Well, you said that part of simplicity is being able to change the code, but if you use pushback in this case, well, the behavior of the code might change later. If I started with pushback my name, and then somebody noticed that my name is a constant, and will just enter that constant as part of improving the program, they will look at my name. Yeah, so that's an interesting argument. Your argument is uh, simplicity is also about having malleability in your code, being able to change it easily. And you're saying if somebody realizes that my name can be a constant and replaces my name with a literal, then they might forget to change pushback and we will have a pessimization. Um, there is, of course, a possible surface area for mistakes here, right? I'm not denying that. I would hope that the person who does that change is also aware of the rule and aware of the difference between pushback and placeback and will also change that alongside the, the variable. Uh, but there is a higher chance of making a mistake. It's true, absolutely. Okay, good. Yeah, one more, and then I'll keep going. Why are you trying to Say that again? You say that you use pushback instead of placeback Yeah. So it's meaningful because and placeback has very different semantics from pushback. I am communicating that the thing I am basically inserting in the vector is not the same type as the vector's element type. I'm communicating there is some sort of conversion or construction going on and that is beneficial over creating the object on the outside. That's the idea here. If I see this line of code with pushback and I know the type of my name, I don't even have to look at the type of names. I know that names is gonna be a vector of string. If I see in placeback, I have no idea what names is. It could be anything. 
because anything that's constructible from a string could be the element type of the vector. So it just makes the code a little bit more flexible and makes my, let's say, surface area in my mind a bit bigger. That's the idea. Make sense? Okay, I'll carry on for a bit. Yeah, we mentioned this. Uh, some more good examples, uh, stud array versus a C-style array. C-style arrays are more powerful. They decay to pointers. It's an extra thing they can do, but we rarely need it. Variant versus polymorphism. This is going a little bit more in the high level, so program design. Um, but virtual polymorphism supports an open set of types. It's more flexible. I can define a virtual interface, and then anybody, even somebody that's not part of my team or my company, can implement it. With variant, I decide at the beginning what are the possible choices. So that's also more power that you might not need. If you can get away with variant, you might not need polymorphism. Uh, stood byte versus char. This is another one that was very controversial when it was introduced, but the idea is the same, right? Char is just a character, it's an 8-bit integer. You can do whatever you want with it. You can add it, multiply it, divide it, and so on. Byte more strongly represents the idea of a, of a byte, and there are a lot of operations that are not allowed for bytes, but they are for char. So if you don't need those operations, and you just need a way of creating like a buffer to and place stuff in it when placed by new, then byte is the simpler choice. Enum class versus enum. Enums allow implicit conversions. So enum class is less powerful, but you want that. You want something that is less flexible to prevent mistakes. So this is the sort of thing I'm moving forward to. So what is the first precept? Does anybody have uh, any idea what we can, how we can summarize this thing in a small sentence? Be specific, maybe? Responsible, write simple code. Choose the less powerful tool, yes, I like that. So I was expecting somebody to say this because this is something that people say all the time, right? Use the right tool of the job. But the problem I have with this sentence is that right is subjective. What does it mean for a tool to be right? So you got really close. This is how I would phrase it. I would say use the most limited tool for the job. If you have a task, find the tool that can solve this task correctly and efficiently, but nothing more powerful than that. And I think that's one way we can move towards simplicity. However, there are places where this doesn't work well. So if you think about it, um, an order map does a lot more than upsale hash map. Upsale hash map is a very simple and efficient hash table, but an order map gives you pointer stability. And if you don't know what that means, basically it means that you can have a, an order map as a drop-in replacement for std map because it guarantees node-based allocation. But most of the times, you might not need the node-based allocation. So should you always use a third-party hash table instead of the C++ standard one? Uh, maybe. But do you need the extra performance? Is it reasonable to include an external dependency? Conceptually speaking, upsell hash map has less flexibility over another map, but maybe it's not the right choice all the time. There are drawbacks. This one is also, in also interesting. Um, aggregate types versus non-aggregates. So aggregates are actually more powerful than on aggregates during initialization and construction. You can construct an aggregate type from any subset of its data members. So for example, if I have this struct called person data, which is an aggregate, it has name, surname, age, and height, I can initialize it just with three elements, you know, the name, surname, and age, forgetting to initialize the height, and then I will get zero by default, but I didn't even think about it, and the compiler will not warn me about it. But now, the counter argument is, should every simple aggregate have a constructor that just boilerplate and forwards everything to the data members? There are cases where you have to be pragmatic, and yeah, maybe this is not the simplest thing according to the precept I mentioned, but is the more pragmatic decision in terms of an engineering trade-off. So I'm not saying to follow my precept as a dogma, but as a guideline that can help you, um, you know, decide things. I'm running out of time. Uniform initialization, it's, it's always going to be bad, so I'm going to skip that. So this is what I would say. Use the most limited tool for the job within reason. And I have that escape hatch there so that, you know, you, you know I've considered the bad cases. A note on abstraction. So this precept for me also holds a higher level of abstraction, not just about language features. But you know, basically, 
don't use a class when a function suffices. If you can get your problem solved with a simple, pure function, why should you use a class or anything like that? It's the same principle, right? Find the most limited thing that works. Second point is something I really care about. I see a lot of overuse of smart pointers, share pointers specifically. But most of the times, you can get away with a simple value, with a T. If you can use a T and solve your problem, why do you need a unique pointer of T? Even more, if you can solve your problem with a unique pointer of T, why do you need a shared pointer of T? It sounds obvious, but I see a lot of people uh, just reaching for these tools because they're used to them and they don't really put any thought into what abstraction they're using. And the last one, multi-threading. Can you prove that multi-threading is something that you need? Have you measured it? Have you done prototypes? Have you considered what is the cost of multi-threading versus multi-process or using an event loop? So again, use the most limited thing that gets the job done in the, um, let's say, uh, within the requirements that you have. And the other point I want to make is that something which is implemented in a complicated way might actually result in simpler code for the users. And this is what I was talking about when we had the I range and, uh, and the normal for loop. The I range one for me is simpler because I can mark I as const and all this thing can do is loop from zero to 100. While the other one, since I is mutable, maybe in the body of the loop, you can change I, you can jump, you can do other things. It's, it, there is more surface area for things to, to, to change, more moving parts. But I range internally will be more complicated than the range based for loop. You have to define the iterator types, all the things that make it work with the range based for loop. So if you hide the complexity in a nice abstraction, you can get the usage to be simpler to, than even um, fundamental language constructs. Okay, second precept. Let's go through this, and I have to be quick, sorry about that, but what do you like between these two? Anybody not familiar with Node Discard? Okay, I'm gonna blow your mind. This is the best 17 feature. It's a very simple attribute, it's called Node Discard. You can put it on any function that returns something, and you will get a warning if you call that function, but ignore the return, type, the return value. So for example, if you have a function that is called initialize, but it returns an integer to tell you whether the initialization was successful or not, if you mark it as no discard, and you forget to look at the integer, you just assume it was valid, you will get a warning. So it forces you to check the return value. Okay, so which one do you like? Okay, okay, interesting. What about now? Has anybody changed their mind on this slide? Anybody that liked the first one, passed to the second one? Yes? Why? Okay. So can I rephrase that as normalize might suggest that you normalize the vector but actually returns one. So the no discard there avoids a misunderstanding, right? Okay, one more. What about this? Which one do you prefer here? Okay, the first one, okay. So this is what I'm trying to get at. If you are careful with the usage of things like no discard, then maybe your code is gonna be simpler. And let me explain what I mean here. I'm gonna skip this because I don't have time, but the principle is the same. So let's say you are tasked with improving the safety of the roads in your city. How would you do it? Like this, you put a nice you know, traffic sign, or like this, you put a million of them, right? By the way, this is the generated with DALI AI generated images. I don't know why I did that just to avoid copyright problems, but it's interesting. It generates very cool things. So this road doesn't exist. Um, my point here is that using a, a feature a lot in, in a lot of places, even consistently, might be technically correct, right? You can use no discard on anything that returns a value. For example, every getter in your classes can be no discard. You can use all, all over the place. You can use no except on everything that doesn't throw. You can use final on all the types that you don't expect to derive from. Constructor as well. But if you actually use a feature sparingly, you can increase its value. And the reason is you are, again, expressing intent. So if I have my vector two implementation here, it's very, very unlikely that somebody will just call x or y and forget to use the return value. Those functions are self-explanatory. If you want to access the x or y component of a vector, you're going to have to do something with it. But the name normalize 
is quite misleading. It feels like it might be an imperative action. I'm going to normalize this vector in place and mutate its values. But in reality, it actually returns a normalized vector. So if we put no discard only on the place where you might have misunderstandings, you draw attention to it. It's not something that you put everywhere. You only put it where it matters. And in this case, it matters, and people are going to pay more attention to it. That's my argument here. Uh, yes. Okay. So, on the aspect of catching the dots early, I would prefer to use it on some of the exercises. So, the comment is that there, people have encountered situations where even trivial getters like this one have been called without being used. I'm interested to, to see how that happens because, like, if you call it, you do nothing with it. Like, fair enough, fair enough, yeah. Yeah, I'm not saying that this doesn't happen. I'm just saying that you would notice this immediately because you wouldn't be able to do anything with it. But we'll see. Yeah. Sure, I agree with that. <laughs> True. True. The comment is, I have a bad name. Well, you could call this get normalized or normalized. Still, I would expect people to. Say that again? Yeah, I agree. The name is not good. But if you put not, the comment is, if you put no discard everywhere, you express intent by committing to it. But my, my argument there is, you are diluting the value of no discard. If you're putting everywhere you can, then the places where it really matters are gonna be as obvious as the others. So if somebody gets used to see no discard everywhere, then the places where it really matters are gonna be less intense. I can take questions later. Um, this is another example, no except. Technically speaking, you can put no except on any function that doesn't throw, right? But have you measured whether that has an impact or not? Have you measured whether that is actually beneficial? Is putting it there actually useful? And when I was writing the book, Embracing Modern C++, uh, we did a lot of tests on this. And no accepts can sometimes be detrimental to performance, even when used correctly. In some compilers, in some cases, it might actually generate more assembly because it needs to see if an exception is thrown in order to call terminate in case the contract was broken. So by carefully finding places where no except matters, for example, move constructors, because the vector reallocation implementation actually checks in the library if no except is present to avoid copying, then using in those places rather than spreading it all over the place without knowing whether it's good or bad, it's part of this, of this idea. Let's use things sparingly only when they actually provide value. And I want to have a note on final, and I'm going to try to finish in five minutes. Um, I've heard the, the comment about, let's use final everywhere when you, you don't expect inheritance to be used. If you don't know what final is, you can put it on top of, um, right after the definition of a struct or a class, and it will prevent that struct or class from being used as a base class. But inheritance in C++ is not always about polymorphism. There are ways you can use inheritance, for example, as a mixing to avoid code repetition or to slightly change the interface of one of your types to do something a little bit different. And my question is, sure, now you think there is any valid use case for your type as a base class, but can you be sure of that in the future? I have had occasions where by using inheritance, I was able to tweak something in the way that I needed, and I would have been really sad if final was put on there, even though this class was not designed for polymorphism at all. And this is one of the reasons why, for example, we call final an unsafe feature in, in, in my book, uh, in the book I wrote with my, with my co-authors. Unsafe here doesn't mean bad, no. It just means that, generally speaking, it's not worth teaching or using, especially a large-scale scale company. It can do more harm than good. And if you use it in places where you think that there is no need for inheritance, then somebody that actually has a good reason to do that might end up being inconvenienced. Very basic example. Before C++ 20, we didn't have uh, the no unique address attribute. So the only way you could compose, uh, let's say, a tuple and have the empty base optimizations was for inheritance. So if you look at the implementation of tuple, 
they actually have to go through their, uh, out of their way to branch on whether something is final or not and store it inside the class or outside the class as a, as a base class. It just gets more complicated for people that are producing abstractions or might want to use your code. However, there are cases, very, very rare cases, where final is almost a requirement. And this is an example that we also have in the book. Um, let's assume we want this int 512 type. Some platforms have a fast built-in type, which is underscore, underscore, whatever. Some platforms don't have that, so we want to provide our own you know, software emulation of that. Now, we should put final there, because if we don't put final there, we have a mismatch between the behavior of the two. You can never derive from fundamental types, but you can derive from user-defined types. And by Hiram's law, if you don't put final there, somebody's going to derive from it. And eventually, when they compile the code on a platform that supports it, they are going to have their code broken because you cannot derive from a fundamental type. So there are places where final is pretty much mandatory in order to you know, uh, maintain the same uh, considerations that we could make for a fundamental type and a non-fundamental type. But it's a rare case, so that's why I say that it should be used sparingly. OK, I'm going to skip this. But in general, const expert, train return types, uh, const variables, all of these things also, I think they should be used sparingly. Override is the odd one out because it should be used liberally. It actually reduces the flexibility of a function. It, it ensures that it overrides. So this is more consistent with the first precept. And yeah, this is what I would say. The second precept is value is a function of rarity. So in order for something that you use in your code base to be perceived as important, be perceived as valuable, to draw attention, if you use it all over the place, you are going to make it less valuable. If you use it where it really matters, where it really has an impact, you actually have more value there. Consistency is important. That was what I wanted to talk about. But it's only a factor among money. And if you're going to read this, it says that consistency is only a virtue if you're not a screw up, right? So being consistent for the sake of it is harmful, in my opinion. I want consistency to be there, but I have to think, why do I want consistency? And consistency can be easier, more convenient than simplicity. For example, Clang Tidy will put no discard on any function that returns by value and doesn't have a side effect. But I don't like that. I want to make it more clear when that is actually beneficial. If you have a strict style guide that tells you exactly how many spaces you need after the period in a comment, don't look, I know that you know what I'm talking about. That's, that's overly you know, complicated. Why do you need that sort of uh, consistency? Does it actually buy you anything, or is it just, just for the sake of it? That's what I'm trying to say. Consistency is good. We should strive for consistency. But after we value correctness and simplicity, then we can put consistency in. Don't be dogmatic if you can afford it. If you have a million developers and they are not trained, then maybe having strict rules is good. But again, the problem for me would be, let's invest in training. Let's teach people what the right thing is, rather than give them rules that are too strict. OK. How do you use these precepts? As I mentioned, they are guidelines. They are not uh, rules. But if you feel excited about a new feature, you know, concepts just came out. I want to use it everywhere. Then maybe this can help curb your enthusiasm a bit and think about, OK, it's actually is using a concept here the most limited tool for the job, or can I get away with overloading? Uh, if you have a conflict between code reviews or debates on whether you use something or not, re referring to this is very helpful. Yes, we could put no discard everywhere, but does it actually help in this case? If you're migrating a legacy project to modern standards, like what I'm doing with SFML, using these precepts usually keeps everybody happy because, yeah, we're using modern things, but we are not overusing them, and we're not going out of our way to, you know, use modern C++. Uh, damage control for new developers. If you teach them to reason like this, it's more likely that they're going to write code that is simpler. And if you teach or mentor people, I also think that this is something you should keep in mind. It helps um, maintain simplicity. So the truth is always in the middle. Um, as I mentioned, the first precept is within reason most of the time. So follow them. I think they are valuable, beneficial in most of the cases, but not blindly. They are tools. Use them to your own benefit. Don't let these tools and guidelines use you. And I derived, derived these precepts from my own research and experience, the things I've done for the book, the things that don't work, open source work. And I feel like that thinking in this way helps me a lot 
maintain and tame the complexity and the surface area of what I can do with C++. If you don't agree, the book that I wrote uh, with my co-authors is objective. Like, it doesn't tell you what's good or what's bad. It tells you, for example, this feature, I don't know, inline namespaces. These are the use cases. These are the things that can go wrong, and these are the annoyances. So if you want to derive your own precepts, you can find all the data in the book. It's very distilled experience, but it doesn't give you any opinion. And then from there, you can derive your own precepts and ideas. Yes, that's it. So I'm really eager to hear your comments, criticisms, stories. As I mentioned, this was a bit of a different talk. I never done anything like this before. It's more philosophical. And I'm sure that many of you will disagree. But if I made you question these things and consider these things, then I consider it a success. So hopefully you enjoyed it. And I think I'm out of time. So I will see you during the break. And you can you know, pick my brain, and we can discuss. Thank you so much.